Right. Why why is the Bitcoin's price so bullish at the moment? This I think it, it could buy interest to you too. And that's why taking a look at the analysis which uh Coin Matrix has done in their uh, just recent analysis, which they published uh, today on uh, November 24th, 2020. So I'm just going to go through the most essential analytical deductions or conclusions, which they have made also in the newsletter, which they've sent out, but the long version is on coinmetrics.io slash dissecting a Bitcoin bull market uh, written by Lucas Nutzi and the coin metrics team. Now, what I'm gonna do is, um, yeah, just go through the most essential ones. Um, in, in essence, they, 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 took, they took a look at uh, some of the most essential things, that is the activities on the exchanges, the regulatory or the alleged regulatory crackdown in China or regulatory scrutiny in China. And the question, you know, are miners driving this rally and also uh, at the end, or pretty much at the end, the role of centralized exchanges, but most importantly, they took a look at the institutional investor, investors, as you've probably heard and, and maybe, you know, uh, seen a lot of statements, interviews, whether it be, you know, Druckenmiller, all those, you know, famous, prominent multi-billionaires, Druckenmiller, the Michael Saylors, um, the Paul Tudor Jones types of guy. So, what I'm trying to say is that we're still so early on the potential vertical takeoff of Bitcoin. Now, you know, it's very tempting, of course, you know, to always think in fiat denominated uh, Bitcoin, but what I'm actually, what we should be actually saying always, instead of the price of Bitcoin, we should be saying like, what is the value, the real value purchasing power, the real actual purchasing power now and in the short term, midterm and long term. Let's go through the, some essential points and I'm going to quote them uh, for educational purposes, of course, dissecting a Bitcoin bull market. That's the la latest um, analysis or newsletter by the coin matrix team. And they're saying a, a pandemic followed by global so societal shutdowns, followed by rampant uh, social unrest, followed by increased political polarization, followed by unprecedented levels of monetary interventionism. This has been 2020. And in the midst of all this uncertainty and chaos, Bitcoin bull market brewed. And then they, you know, go through all the potential reasons or, you know, factual analysis, what the reasons could be for this bullish uh, price sentiment or Bitcoin's price jacking up. In the first paragraph, it's saying some have speculated that this rally is being predominantly driven by increased regulatory scrutiny in China, which has prevented miners and market participants from selling their Bitcoin. Others attributed to increased institutional participation after Bitcoin received a trove of endorsements from high profile macro investors. And what they're doing is actually evaluating the merit of each of these narratives through the use of network data. And the first question they're posing is that are miners focusing now on China driving this rally? It is no secret they're saying that Beijing has been cracking down on Bitcoin businesses from miners to exchanges. Earlier this month, news broke that both Huobi and OKEx, two of the largest exchanges operating in China, are facing a stronger reg regulatory scrutiny as part of the country's new mandate to fight money laundering and fraud now. Further on, they're saying now local industrial observers have reported that the bank accounts of many Shenzhen miners have been frozen as part of this regulatory crackdown. Now, I, I didn't even think that it was the, because of the regulatory crackdown, which is just, you know, the, the market is already, you know, mature to a certain degree. Uh, there's other outlets, other, you know, ventilation <laughs> sort of for Bitcoin. And what they're also saying in this uh, newsletter or article, media outlets have hypothesized that the recent run-up in Bitcoin's price was a direct result of this crackdown. If miners are unable to sell the Bitcoin, a sustained disruption in the existing supply chain would ultimately generate scarcity. Thus far, however, solid evidence of the impact of the crackdown on mining operations has been anecdotal. Thankfully, we have devised metrics to assess this impact more obje objectively by tracking the movements of newly issued Bitcoin. So they've really done a beautiful job dissecting and uh, breaking everything down. And what uh, they're also saying is that over the course of 2020, 
we have closely analyzed the on-chain custody behavior of both mining pool operators and their individual miners. We have found that unspent mining rewards provide a good proxy for aggregate mining pool custody since mining pools issue payouts to all of their participants. Supply that sits one transaction from mining pool is a good representation of the holdings of individual miners. The culmination of this research was a new family of metrics released in October that can provide a view of when these network participants are accumulating or disseminating the Bitcoins they mine. On an aggregate basis, the amount of Bitcoin held by mining pool operators has increased over the course of 2020. Notably, there was a sharp spike in April ahead of the halving and a steady increase followed. Conversely, Bitcoin held by individual miners has decreased in 2020 and a particularly increased rate in November. So this is the graph that shows it pretty much clearly, you know, the purple is Bitcoin held by mining pools and the green uh, curve or um, diagram sort of is Bitcoin held by individual miners. They're deducting uh, conclusion sort of is if in fact there was a liquidity, if there was a liquidity crunch predominantly driven by miners, one would expect the amount of Bitcoin held by both pools which is in purple and individual miners in green to increase since individual miners are the liquidity gateways of newly issued Bitcoins, any supply chain disruption would entail an increase in their holdings, whereas the opposite seems to be taking place. All right, and what else is important is, is what they're saying is that as of November 21st, 809,217 Bitcoin has left minor accounts at this space the sum of Bitcoin sent by miners in November will surpass the yearly average of 1,052,589 Bitcoin sent per month. And coupled with the aforementioned data on Bitcoin held by miners, the lack of a clear change in miner outflows discredits the hypothesis that miners have not been able to sell as a result of a regulatory crackdown in China. Saying another troublesome factor in attributing the rally to miners is the size of Bitcoin markets. At a market cap of over $300 billion, I think it's around now, what is it, 320, 250, it doesn't really matter. It is very unlikely that the rally of this magnitude could have been caused by miners alone. After all, miners are incentivized to hoard Bitcoin. They are rewarded in volatile currency, whereas their operations entail monthly expenses paid in fiat as such their impact on the market decreases as less Bitcoin is issued. Then they, you know, they analyze the role of centralized exchanges, you know, that uh, actually that uh, Huobi and OKIX are, you know, the largest um, centralized exchanges in Asia. And then they also mention Bitfinex, Bitmex, Binance, Bitstamp, Bitrex, Gemini, Kraken, and Poloniex. And they're saying that they have noticed an aggregate reduction of Bitcoin holdings by the major exchanges with uh, we, we support. So it means, you know, more and more people are withdrawing from the exchanges to their cold storage or hardware wallets. This is here, we can see percentage of Bitcoin supply held by major exchanges, excluding Huobi exchange. Purple again is percent of Bitcoin held by major exchanges and green is Bitcoin per USD, US dollar price. And then it says here, um, even if even though Beijing's crackdown on Bitcoin businesses has undoubtedly impacted Huobi, there might be other factors reducing assets under custody by exchanges in the West. So I'm not going to go even into the stable coin because, you know, it's just a, a, just a, you know, chapter for itself. Another contributing factor might be the rise of wrapped versions of Bitcoin, while stable coins might provide utility equivalents to an exchange's fiat on off ramps, wrapped Bitcoin might compete for other exchange services such as lending. Okay, so that's a whole different, you know, uh, topic. Then uh, they're also saying 2017 looks different uh, compared to now. And on a relative basis, the 2017 bull market had an entirely different on-chain footprint than what we are witnessing today. Back then, Bitcoin held by exchanges nearly doubled as Bitcoin flirted with 20,000 US dollars for the first time. This is Bitcoin held by major exchanges in 2017 bull market. This is 2017. So green is Bitcoin held by major exchanges. You see the difference, right? And uh, Bitcoin in purple is Bitcoin per USD dollar price. 
for 2017. So that's the def difference. Okay. Um, what also is, I think, worth mentioning is they're saying that it makes sense that the retail driven rally would increase Bitcoin held by major exchanges since there are clear educational frictions in self custodying assets. So, so you know, the, the comprehension of why, you know, custody, self custody yourself, self responsibly, be a self sovereign Bitcoin citizen and uh, has dramatically gone up, you know, uh, you know, also. You know, lots more educational uh, materials, lots, you know, you better user friendly, better user interfaces, uh, much, you know, a lot of content, podcasts, um, you know, the whole FOMO and the prices, of course, is always the number go up has contributed to this fact. So many retail investors prefer to defer custody to centralized service providers which is interesting, even though the industry has come a long way, especially in terms of hardware options for self-custody, there's still a steep learning curve that makes newcomers gravitate towards centralized exchanges, which you know doesn't surprise me. I mean, I just talk to people outside of the Bitcoins, eco chamber and you know, hyper-intellectualized uh, self-adulating bubble sort of uh, it's not a bubble but you know it's sort of a uh, it's sort of a you know sort of a brain masturbation a lot of brain masturbation going on and i think we are a lot of bitcoiners or bitcoin community bitcoin spaces is, is pretty much uh in my from my observation from my observation and experience and encountering uh in talks and conversations with people outside here you know uh People are not on Twitter. People are not on, you know, in the Bitcoin space. People are not, you know, most, a lot of people don't speak, speak English. So we have to go a long way. We have to break it down. We have to empathize much more, you know, on an emotional, psychological and intellectual pedagogical level. Anyway, I'm going to stop with this rant, but uh, we, we still have a lot, you know, I mean, of, uh, things have to become much more easier, use interface, use experience. So, uh, you know, it's not like me uh, or other Bitcoin is spending so much time and, and intellectual capacities uh, going into discuss, going deep down the rabbit hole. People just don't have patience that the time they don't, have, you know, they have a life to live. They have responsibilities. They have to take care of their kids of their, you know, they, they have a, a nine to five job, maybe even. Um, and, and, and it's a lot of hurdles, you know. So, um, what else uh, worth uh, mentioning is that, yeah, to just go to the conclusion, it says here, a conclusion, our analysis of minor, of the minors, uh, of the minor behavior coupled with custody data on Huobi shows no evidence to suggest this rally is being predominantly driven by a regulatory crackdown in China. There you go. The downward trend, the downward trend in, uh, what is it, AU, C exchanges, is that Australian, whatever, uh, by retail exchanges may be an indication that this rally is being driven by increased institutional adoption, given the use of over-the-counter on ramps and increase in institutional participation would result in positive price action, but limited on-chain footprint, which is what we might be witnessing in this bull market. So we are still so early and even, you know, this is the question I'm always asking, when are the big like pension funds who are, who are you know, who have assets on the management um, uh, and for good reasons, you know, they're not moving, they're not, you know, taking action because um, it's not only, uh, you know, the, uh, the fiduciary duty that has to kick in, but also um, it's the, I guess the pressure hasn't built up yet uh, the, you know, the, the, the disastrous fiat uh, central banking uh, policies haven't really quite, you know, reached that momentum yet. And, uh, and what I've heard is even a lot of uh, big institutions um, have not even started accumulating gold. So, you know, it's always a good uh, comparison or good metric, but but I think it won't take a long time. I mean, first it's gonna be, you know, the ultra net worth uh, people, uh, ultra net rich people, or, you know, corporations or businesses. And then we're going to see more and more, you know, bigger uh, national, multinational uh, corporations, uh, hedge fund, mutual funds, um, uh, especially pension funds 
who uh, allegedly, you know, sitting on probably 50 to 70 trillion dollars. Uh, uh, but I think if once, once the pressure mount, uh, you know, builds up, I think we're going to see a multi-trillion dollar market cap very, very, you know, suddenly, unexpectedly, because it just takes, you know, a few percentage of the whole entire assets uh, of each one of each of the pension funds and other institutions, and it will go really straight up vertically to, uh, yeah. By then, you know, I'm just asking myself, are we really going to think and compare in fear-dominated Bitcoin's price? Or are we going already, you know, starting to think and and value Bitcoin and and, and think in satoshis in Sats? So it's at the end of the day, it's always about the purchasing power. And this is why it's so distractive uh, to think in fiat terms, because the inflation rate is going to be really so exponential by that time. Uh, and it's all interconnected, you know, the whole uh, negative yielding bonds. I mean, we have a hundred trillion dollar bond market. And I think it was Preston Pish who always said that once, once a bond market implodes or explodes, I think we're going to see a huge, I mean, capital escape to to Bitcoin, and simultaneously on other, on any other level we can imagine and you can think of. So, um, so that's why you know, uh, what does half a million per Bitcoin even mean then? You know, by that time in a couple of years. So that's this, this is why it can be really confusing, really. Uh, um, sort of a deceiving, I think, to think in fiat terms. And I think it's time to, you know, slowly in a transitional phases to think more and more in sats, like what is a loaf of bread or whatever, you know, is it gonna cost like a million Satoshis, that's 0.01 Bitcoin, like what is it? Uh, what is it worth? What is the value? What can I buy with it? You know, that's why this deflationary comics, uh, which we're really uh, should be looking forward to, which Def Jeff Booth has been preaching about, you know, uh, deflationary economics, deflationary technologies. So um, eventually everything will become cheaper and cheaper, not just, you know, the, the usual technological devices and gadgets we're used to, whether it be smartphones, computer, laptops, and TV and whatever, but, but I mean, every other on every structural level, technological wise, um, and more and more technological innovation, whether it be transportation, energy, uh, health uh, technologies. Um, I mean, any, any, any other you know, structural, structural technology we have been missing in the last hundred years or that has been suppressed or whatever within the military industrial corporate complex. So yeah, it's just more of Bitcoin, you know, as I said, is more than just uh, building up wealth and, um, you know, and, and escaping from this inflation, hyperinflationary uh, trajectory. It's, it's really, it's about freedom. It's about technological innovations, about uh, uh, total uh, individual and collective sovereignty. And it's about, um, uh, yeah, it's about evolution on every level. And this is why we need to talk about uh, as a responsible, you know, human being, like what kind of structures do we need to prepare? What kind of uh, social fabric do we need to create for ourselves and of our posterity for our children in order, you know, to have a quality of life? And this is becomes more and more, it's not utopian. It's just people, I think, are not ready yet or they're just so uh, encapsulated in their own, you know, box that they can only think either in monetary, economical, financial, and whatever investment terms and, and you know, uh, processes. But actually we should be already talking about like what kind of structures do we need to establish to create so that, you know, this um, uh, new, uh, you know, to holistic evolution can take place, you know, can unleash itself on every level you can think of, you know, on social level, on structural level, on, um, uh, on transportation level, on, uh, on educational level for our children, right? On, um, yeah, even defense, defensive level, right? Because we're not, we, I don't, because this is, uh, was a good interview and talk with Stacey Heber-Max-Kaiser with this, uh, what's, what's his name, Sean Ono-Lennon, 
And he asked, you know, what's going to happen to the military industrial complex? You know, you're just going to, are we going to have like a chaos or, I mean, something like that in that direction. I found these questions pretty finally overdue. You know, somebody had to ask this question, what's going to happen, you know, to this whole gigantic monstrum of uh, the military industrial corporate intelligence co uh, complex? Um, because it's about power, it's about, you know, aggression, it's about violence, it's about, you know, destruction. Uh, although, you know, so maybe this, this should be dedicated to a, to a whole series of, of episodes and interviews. Anyway, I'm going to stop with my rant. Thank you so much for your attention, for, for, you know, listening in. Let me know if you have any questions, any wishes, any suggestions for future uh, guests, interviews, which I should or, or could maybe ask on. Unfortunately, Michael Selle has not even answered, responded to my request, even though he had actually on uh, September 21st written me back on my di direct message that he's, you know, I should just email him and he's willing to help and, you know, set up an interview. But since then, you know, no reply, no email, nothing. I even contacted his assistant, Bonnie. She said she, she first asked, you know, uh, what, what, what's my audience like? And, you know, so I explained everything to her so that I, can, that I would also use this material for the documentary or a short video or a film production. So, you know, it's good because, you know, I have a very specific questions that I wanted to ask him, which no other actual Bitcoiner has asked him so far. And, um, but, you know, that's the way, that's what, unfortunately, uh, I get no feedback. So I have to uh, maybe find some other uh, people who, who have, you know, the insights or the wisdom or the comprehension uh, to share, you know, their thoughts, their perspective and vision uh, how is this going to evolve, you know, the structures, you know, uh, it, with, you know, going this into this process, into this Bitcoinized, hyper Bitcoinized world. And we're not, you know, we're still early. I, you know, I get that, but we, we have to, I think, talk about it and educate people what it means to, you know, to go to transition into a Bitcoinized uh, society, uh, structures, uh, what have you. So thank you so much again. Please follow me on Twitter, Kevin Davani. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel. We have different podcast platforms. Leave a positive five-star review if, if you love any of my episodes um, uh, or any of the interviews I've done. Thank you so much. I hope you know I can contribute more and more uh, with unconditional love and wisdom. And see you soon again. Thank you so much. Bye.